Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. Uh, we're going to continue looking at Revelation 12 on a line. But before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are thankful for the study that we have each morning. And um, we invite your presence here as we open your word together. We know that we've been struggling uh, to understand Revelation 12, 13, and 17 and its relation to uh, Daniel chapter 11, verse uh, 2 and 3. And we just ask, Lord, that as we continue to examine these truths, that you can give us wisdom and understanding. Thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Well, good morning, everyone. Hi there, Stephen and Angela. Just come on. Nice to see you here this morning. And uh, um, yesterday was quite quite a study. I got carried away. I went a little bit late. Um, I did uh, make the font a little bit larger here, um, but probably what I should do. And I know a lot of times it has to do with the person's reception and how clear a picture they get. Um, but we had gone yesterday through uh, beginning to draw, draw Revelation 12 on a line, and we went through the different seven things uh, that we have. So, um, you know, I probably could have this one entitled The Seven Kings of Rome. Oops. Should the first seven kings, maybe even, but I'll just leave this the seven kings of Rome. This is the monarchy, and um, we went through that a little bit. Um, and then we also went through the seven hills of Rome and then the seven forms of Roman government. Now, the problem here with the seven forms of Roman government is there is different, there's probably more than this. Uh, depends how you decide this. This this form is just basically the, the kings, the monarchy, um, the consuls, uh, the dictators who were put there in time of war, uh, this dissimilar, so that's when they have 10, the triumvirate, and there's a few of them when they had three ruling together. And then of course they have the emperors and then that, that the imperial Rome, beginning with Augustus, which we have there on the right to, next to it, the first 10 emperors. Um, and then, of course, we have the papal form of government. Now, as far as the seven kings, uh, you know, there's a dispute whether they actually existed, um, at least in this form, and, and how long did they actually reign. One guy says it's impossible to have had seven kings reign in this period of whatever it is, 247 years, um, 240, 254 years. How many years is that? 200 and, 244. 244 years. Yeah. Well, sorry. I, I'm looking because that, that's I'm going 7. Right. Yeah, 509. So you just take off nine. So that would be 742, right? 744, 744, that 244, pardon me. So 244 years, um, 245 inclusive or whatever you want to call it. Um, now, I don't know if it's impossible that they would have these average number of reigns. I mean, usually what ends up happening, because I looked at the kings of Judah and, you know, you have some pretty long reigns. Um, then you have some shorter reigns, right? So normally what ends up happening is you have some kings that aren't going to uh, live very long for various reasons. Uh, when it comes to the kings of Israel, you know, becoming a king of Israel is a death sentence pretty much um, for many of them. So, you know, to say that they had this period of time in which they were stable, they were still relatively small, there wouldn't have been a lot of infighting uh, going on. There wasn't constantly people being executed like you get later on with the emperors or people committing suicide or overthrown or whatever, things type of things that happen. 
Um, so, uh, you know, I, to say it's impossible, I don't think that's, that's, you know, it's, it's improbable, but improbable and impossible are quite two different th things. Um, lots of improbable things happen. Impossible things never happen by definition. Um, so I don't think it's impossible, but whether these seven kings actually existed as this, whether these reigns are correct, we don't know because this is just what the Romans understood, you know, hundreds of years later. Um, but, uh, but the thing is the fact that there are seven, at least as a symbol exists where we can, we can say that this, this seven kings at the beginning of Rome, if the seven heads represent those seven kings, that would make sense. Now, when it comes to the seven hills of Rome, that seems to apply much more to the beast of Revelation 17. And then here we have the seven forms of government, which is the pioneer view of what the heads represent. But that is primarily because they are interpreting the heads on all the beasts as the same, and they're applying the riddle to the heads. So in order to get this seven forms of government, I think it's an arbitrary list, to be honest, um, because there are more forms of government that occur. Now, so to me, this list is incomplete. And, and so I'm leaning towards that, you know, the seven forms of government is probably not the correct symbol that's being used there. But the seven kings um, of Rome would definitely be a symbol that we could apply to pagan Rome. And they're going to have crowns upon their heads, which means that they're kings. To say that they're forms of government with crowns on their heads doesn't really make much sense to me. Um, I wouldn't take the view that these seven heads represent, which we didn't put in this these lists. We didn't have, uh, you know, the seven. Uh, we'll do that in one of the other ones. With Revelation 13, we'll put there, instead of the seven forms of government, we'll put um, the seven kingdoms of Bible prophecy, right? So we're going to put Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, Rome, etc., right? So we're going to do that there when we look at Revelation 13, which makes sense for Revelation 13, but it doesn't make sense for Revelation 12 to put the kings in there. And I don't think it makes sense to have the seven forms of Ro Roman government. Is it Lucius? Did I get the name wrong? Lucius? Like this, you're saying. Uh, just there was a note in the chat, just as far as the names. I probably typed in something wrong. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So one, there, there's a couple of points that may need to be addressed, but they may just be superficial okay one of the things about this as we consider the seven kings of rome we need to keep in mind that these were elected as kings yeah so this was not it, yeah so they were elected it was not like we normally think of kings you know that your son uh follows you uh they would elect these kings so it was still a kind of a democratic uh monarchy if you want to put it that way. But you have the first and the last two that chose to seize the power. Okay. So yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So obviously, yeah. Romulus. Uh, um, Romulus proclaimed himself king after murdering yeah. Remus. Yeah. Is what they say. Yeah, which is probably not a true story. At least we don't know exactly how that happened. But um, and that's the thing is when it comes to what's what's credited to these kings may not actually be what actually they did. But but it must be based on some kind of existing history. So okay, and uh, go on. So at you know as you as we go through this. 
um, Ancus Marcius was the grandson of Numa Pompilius and was mm -hmm. five years old at the time of his grandfather's death. But he mm -hmm. was elected king after the death of Tullius Postilius. Yeah. But when you when you come down here to like service Tullius, he was the son-in-law of Lucius Tarquinius Priscius, and he seized the king kingdom after Ancus sons. So that would have been Ancus Martius. Had Tarquinius Priscius assassinated. Yeah. So there was a bit of intrigue with some of this. There's there's quite a bit where there were, you know, what looked to be elections and then somewhere the power was just being seized. Yeah. Now, of course, with this history, we don't know how, how much of it is true or manufactured, like how much of it is manufactured later on as legend. So, um, so that's one of the problems with this history. We just don't really know how much of it is accurate. Now, hundreds of years later, the other the other thing about this with the seven forms of government, mm -hmm. it was interesting to look at this and to consider that the consular, dictatorial, decimerable, and triumvirates all existed prior to the Roman emperors, prior to the, the imperial Rome. Mm -hmm. And many of those existed all at the same time. Yeah, they weren't successive. No, they were not. No. And there's also other forms that people list. Uh, I can't remember them all. Um, so let me see if I go back here. Um, and, uh, let me see here. Yeah, I can't find the list I had here. Um, well, you know, maybe I, you know, I don't understand this all that well. I mean, some people have a senatorial in their list. That well, may be consular, maybe just another name for it. Let me... But because I tried reading on all this, maybe you know a bit more, but I tried reading on all this, and there's just so much almost disagreement about all of this, like not just from the prophetic point of view, but when you read about the history of the Roman government, you have quite different views about how it developed and what happened. So anyway, so you probably know a bit more about it than I do. Well, I'm not saying that. But I'm, I'm asking and I'm looking at this because there's been such a focus from this with Colin about specific individuals and directly that meaning Trump mm -hmm. that I had to ask if the list that we're going to have to look at here should not apply with a person but should apply as a type to look at the history of the governments of the United States. Okay, yeah. Well, the thing about, okay, so when we deal with Rome, you know, governments go through different forms, you know, through history, right? I mean, the United States is going to have different uh, ways in which they operated. I mean, first they were under, uh, you know, England, right? They were under control of England. Uh, then they had a, a revolution. 
and they began to set up forms of government, right? Um, of course, they, they were different states, so they, you know, became the United States of America, and, um, you know, they had a constitution, they were modeling themselves after uh, an idea of a republic, um, and, you know, of course, it was a democracy, which, you know, in some ways, those two things are seen as quite different, you know, um, uh, but yet, you know, we just sort of, in America, they're kind of put together, you know, republics don't necessarily have to be demo democratic in the way, like a democracy is the rule of the people, um, where a republic is a rule by a constitution, obviously of people and leaders, but the constitution is, is, guides that country where in a democracy things can go different directions depending on elections and votes right so so that that becomes a, a you know a, a difference and then i mean obviously the united states develops and how you name things and how you set up governments um like with rome um you know, they give names to these things because of decisions that they're making. You know, when you have the, the, the senatorial form of government, you have the Senate and it's running things. Obviously, a dictatorial, we think of as like a dictator. But basically, when they were in a time of, of, of war, it was too slow a process to go through the regular government uh governmental process it doesn't mean that the dictator that you know they he just took over and ran the country like we think of as dictator but it's just somebody had a single person had power to make decisions so that they could uh mobilize for war right but there uh, were there were also times that the dictators were appointed for religious purposes as well okay yeah that that i never read about but now yeah. So, but the point is, this isn't like some progression of seven heads, and and there definitely seems to be more than seven forms of Roman government. Like some won't even include the monarchical; they they're just going to start with the republic, um, because there's other forms of government, and they they're just not going to include that. Right now, William Miller does include that. Um, um let's you know one one of the things that i i'm looking at and i'm trying to puzzle through yeah you have these seven forms of government yeah was the united states ever under a monarchy well they were under a monarchy when they were under england correct but was the United States ever under a dissemble form of government? Um, I don't think so, but I could be wrong. I don't know consider, much about it. Consider what Elder Jeff presented. Because under the Con Confederation Congress, you had 10 presidents. Yeah, but they weren't all at the same time. Well, most of these types of government were all at the same time. But then I, I was also looking at the triumvirate. Has the United States ever been under a triumvirate? Well, I think in some ways they're under a triumvirate now. What I mean, the th three, because they had, you know, the executive and uh, the judicial and the legislative um, and legislative branches. But that's not really a triumvirate in the sense of how this was done, triumvirate, and how it was done in the time of Rome, where you had three individuals who decided to work together uh, to run the country. Um, I don't know. I d and, and I don't see a December December 
Did I spell that right? Did I spell that wrong? I don't know why the tutorial doesn't shows that it's spelled wrong. Anyway, um, uh, the point is we have um, we have definitely more than seven forms of government, and I don't think that we can line these up with the American forms of government. And I just think we should take that out completely as anything to do with with pagan Rome. That's that's my opinion. It it doesn't it doesn't really fit. I mean, because one is there's more than seven, and you know, and Miller he doesn't have the papal he has kings, right? So he's going to take the uh, the division of the Roman Empire with these different kings as the seventh form. He's not even going to put the papal form in there. Um, so I just don't see that it fits. The more that I've looked at this as a symbol, the seven kings of Rome, which would be known by the people in that time, they make much more sense to fit as symbolizing those seven heads. And definitely for Revelation 17, the seven hills, we are told it's seven mountains, the seven heads. So that fits for Revelation 17. But I don't see how the seven forms of government fit or have anything to do here with prophecy because they don't exist as seven forms of government. How would mountains have been viewed by Father Miller? Well, did they took them as the seven hills of Rome. No. How would mountains have been viewed by Father Miller? Well, mount, mountains can be kingdoms, but can that's be, just one of the symbols of mountains. Can be kingdoms, can be governments, can be, I mean, multiple things, right? Except that mountains are not a symbol. Mountains is an explanation. It says the seven heads are seven mountains. So you don't, you wouldn't take the explanation and understand it symbolically. You would take it as an explanation. Right? It's just like when you say the waters are people's multitudes, nations, and tongues. Well, you now had an explanation of what the waters are. You're not going to then say, well, peoples are symbols, nations are symbols, tongues are symbols. They're now the explanation. So if it says the seven heads are seven mountains upon which the woman sitteth, that's just describing the city of Rome. It's, it's telling you that this woman is sitting at Rome. So you're not going to now take those as symbols. Right. Well, you you made a statement. Yeah. And there wasn't so, much there, there wasn't much to be said to the statement. It wasn't a question. No, I know. But the point okay. is that that statement, you know, you must have a thought about it. I was looking at this, especially about mountains, as Uh, you're saying it's an explanation. I looked at it as a symbol because when when we look in other portions of Revelations where the mountains are moved out of their place, it's like saying the governments are, are being removed. Right. So we know that mountains symbolize kingdoms and governments, etc. But 
But those are in visions. They're not in explanations. Right? All, so all he, I'm saying is that the yeah. literal mountains are not, is not what's being referred to here. Right. In, in, in when the mountains are moved out of their places. Right. Right. But that's because it's a vision and you have things as symbols. But when you have an angel explaining something, he's not he's not giving you a symbol in the explanation, right? So um, I'm just going to share this screen here. So you go look at Revelation 17, which, which we're going to deal with later. But um, Right, so in Revelation 17, 9, here's a mind that hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. To me, that's an explanation. It's saying, we have these seven heads. That's the symbol. The symbol is the seven heads. But these seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. That would be describing Rome. That's describing the seat of Rome. And so the woman who is riding this beast is seated in Rome. So we can see clearly that this woman is the papacy. And then when it says, and there are seven kings, five are fallen, it doesn't say that the seven heads are seven mountains, which are seven kings. It says, and there are seven kings. So, so this is something else that we need to understand. There's seven heads. These are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. But also there are seven kings. So this is some other symbol. The kings are not the heads. The kings are not the mountains. It doesn't say that they are. It's just an assumption that we make. So we'll address these later so when we get to Revelation 17. The point is there's no reason to say that the heads are the same in each of the beasts. Because clearly they can't be. If we have pagan Rome, paper Rome, and modern Rome as these seven beasts, and, and they're different, the heads are different, they have a different explanation, they have different characteristics, and the horns are different, there's no reason to say that they symbolize the same thing. It would make much more sense to say that in each of these beasts, we have this seven heads and ten horns, but they represent different things in, in the different beasts. Now, this is something, you know, that we had never really considered to this extent before, right? We would know the beasts are different. We know there was characteristics about the heads that are different and about the horns that are different. But we were always trying to apply the same symbol to the heads. The heads represent something in each of the beasts, and that something is always the same thing. But I think we have to abandon that idea that that was just a supposition that really had no basis and, and, and doesn't really span out. Because when we looked at, at Uriah Smith's arguments, we could see that he kept arguing against himself when he was trying to establish that the seven heads were the seven forms of Roman government. And so he would create an argument but that argument was really undoing his own argument, right? Where he would try to say, well, you know, they can include the papal head because that's still going to be part of Rome, but that's that's not really pagan Rome, right? Papal Rome is, is Revelation 13. And then he says, well, we can't have these heads uh, be forms, forms of government that didn't exist. Um, so, you know, we, or not forms of government, but nations that didn't exist, but yet, the beast itself is a leopard-like beast that has all the characteristics of Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, and Rome. So, so the papal beast of Revelation 13 already has those characteristics. And then he tries to argue, well, if they have those characteristics, they don't need to be repeated again in the heads. But actually, that, that's the very reason why the heads would represent the progression of those kingdoms, right? Now... And when you deal with the composite beast, just because Angela made a comment about, you know, the different forms of government, we see why Rome is a composite beast. Well, the idea of the composite beast, the idea of Rome 
is is not that it's it's diverse in the sense that it has different forms of government because any nation is going to have different forms of government as they progress especially something like an empire it doesn't just start as an empire it starts and develops the reason why rome is has this composite nature is because of how it assimilates the various cultures that it conquers and we see this right in the beginning with the kings when they when rome is developing um they have the etruscans and the, the sabines and and these different people around them and and they have kings that are etruscan and sabine and you know they 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 have right from the beginning have this ability to assimilate and adapt to uh that makes them able to expand because most other nations have their gods and would conquer peoples and impose their religion upon them if you look at the babylonians i mean they would they had a protection racket um so different governments did different things rome can't uh they adapted all these ideas that were around them and developed them. So that's why they're this, this composite beast. But so getting back to this, to uh, the seven heads in Revelation 12, if this is pagan Rome, you know, the idea that there's seven forms of government when there's more than seven forms in this sort of arbitrary way in which we try to get this fit to a number seven. We already have a number seven, which is the seven kings that found Rome. And to me, that makes the most sense to take though that seven heads that have seven crowns, which represent kings, to represent pagan Rome. It begins with these seven crowns. But then it's also going to have ten horns. And so these horns... These become, to me, the more intriguing part to try to understand. Because it's pagan Rome, I don't think it makes sense to apply to it uh, the conquering nations uh, that end up destroying Rome. I mean, uh, this has to do with this, this history here of pagan Rome However, we want to understand it, this this part of pagan Rome that's being illustrated so that the people who are reading this understand what it's talking about. They're going to know it's talking about Rome. Right. They're going to understand that. And, and even when they get to the seven heads, I mean, they're going to know that means Rome. They're not going to understand necessarily what this woman is, you know, at the time that this is written. Um, but the thing is, these symbols are familiar to the people at that time you know so john is using symbols from the bible and uh symbols that would apply then to you know any christian is going to see that this is going to be about what happened with the birth of christ and they're going to know it has something to do with the church they may not understand all of the implications because it's not time to understand it but they would have this idea that this is persecution that's coming right because it's already there for one <clears throat> so i don't know what people think about that but that that's that's where i'm leaning in my view of these these seven kings and then we have this republic right and then we have events and we have to decide what events are going to be the formalization of this message, this first message that arrives, what's going to be its empowerment, and what's going to be the second angel's message that arrives. So in understanding the history of Rome during its republic, um, and the question is, why is it the beginning of the republic that marks the time of the end of those seven kings? People kind of get what I'm getting at.
or am I off base? You know, so if anybody thinks I'm abandoning the pioneer's view here. Because I was taking the position before, well, the pioneer's view could make sense. It's just that the more that I looked into it, I couldn't clearly mark these seven forms of government. But I can mark seven kings of Rome. And I can mark seven hills of Rome, right? So if we're going to move ahead, we're going to have to decide how we're going to do this as far as we have this Roman Republic from 509 BC to 27 BC. And we're going to say that that's going to mark the first message. So what are the events that we would mark as a formalization and empowerment in the history of Rome? Like, for instance, would we put uh, the League of the Rome, Romans with the Jews in here? Would we put uh, the siege of Jerusalem by Rome, Rome conquering Jerusalem? Would we put that in here? And if we did, why would we do that? Well, the chart has the uh, see the, the League of Rome and the siege of Rome on a siege of Jerusalem. I mean, yeah, and the League with Rome. So I think it's very important. Okay, so, well, we definitely have one fifty-eight. Um, we don't have the siege of Jerusalem on the chart. 1846, I think, is, is on there. Hmm? No? 66 70, is it on? Yeah, 1846. On the 1843 chart? No. Six. Did no. I imagine it? I thought Cestius was on there. Maybe it's the 50. Maybe it's the 1850 chart? Uh, it's, I'm looking at the 1843 chart right now, and it doesn't have uh, doesn't have it listed in your main column in the center. But we do have 158. So, but if we're going to put that there, we would have to have a reason why would we would put these events connected with Jerusalem, and and I think we could see that there is a reason why we would do that. And, and even with the seven kings, one of the reasons I, I looked at, because I had this date before, right? So I had this date, 509, because I looked at the anointing of Saul. And I looked at the 84 years to this, from the anointing of Saul to the laying of the foundation of the temple by Solomon. And then the seven years to complete the temple. And I multiplied 84 by 7. And so I counted from the anointing of Saul, 84 by 7 years, which is 588 years. And I came to 509. And that's going to be seven years after the temple is, the second temple is completed. And you can see there, there's that chiasm of seven years, 490 years, and seven years. But at that time in 509, or when I looked at it, I put 509. So this is in 2014 that I did this. I didn't know what 509 would mean, right? I never knew about the Roman Republic. I wasn't, wasn't I don't, still don't know much about Roman history. But we now then came up with that date again when we were studying this line, right? And, and and we had we had done this with the sabbatical and jubilee cycles. <coughs> we I just have a drawing of it again at, at the bottom there. So you got that um, lining up with 1097 BC, the 83 times seven, and then finally the 84th period of 70 year, seven years, and that's going to line up with 516. So it's the same thing. Then the Roman Republic, and then Imperial Roman, we put. 27 BC to 476 AD.
Okay, so um, so if we take that 509 as significant, so we go back here um, to this chart. I'm saying that we can say that this is connected with this line, these lines and this chronology of Israel. Right. So we can say that those seven kings represent that seven years from the building of the second temple to the founding of the Roman Republic. So what if we took um, the next formalization of this as being 158? So if we did that, would that be meaningful based on what we understand already? And if that's a formalization, what would be the logical empowerment? What would we put here? Okay, any any ideas? Nobody wants to talk about this. What would we put if if this is logical? We have the Roman Republic. Now, the Roman Republic's going to inter interact with God's people, right? That's when a kingdom comes into Bible prophecy. And we're going to place that as 158. That's the date Miller gives. Right. And, and we have also, yeah, we, we equate this with the first angel arriving because we're paralleling it with Millerite history, right? So we're saying that, just commenting on Angela's uh chat comment in the chat so we're saying that 509 bc it lines up with 1798 right so would that be if you're going to say this is empowered would that have to line up with 63 bc yes that's what i'm saying so so we would look at this and we would say this is because it's going to be that league with Rome that leads to Jerusalem being conquered by Rome. Right. In 63 BC. So, so we can see the logic of this at this point. And then we have the end of the Roman Republic. So we're going to have the rise of the Caesars. So the, the first Caesar being Augustus and Augustus, it's in the time of Caesar and Augustus, but the time of the end happens uh, for the line of Christ, right? For this, you know, dealing with the 70 weeks and, and all that, right? So it's all connected to that prophecy. So then we're going to have the period of imperial Rome being represented under this second angel's message. So, you know, we're going to see things like, well, obviously the birth of Christ and you know, Christ's baptism and his crucifixion, those things would be represented in that history. So we haven't dealt with that yet. But if we look at this time of the Roman Republic, 
we can see that this is paralleling the United States, the idea of republicanism, right? All right. So that's why we would say this makes sense. It fits in chrono chronologically with a larger structure dealing with uh, God's people, right? The kings and, and like the Leviticus 26 fulfillment dealing with uh, this progression of of the four seven times, and so so this is going to be connected to that, and so it, it now we can connect it with the with this structure, but the seven kings, whether they're the seven heads or not, they still stand as a symbol at the beginning of this line, and they can represent the seventy years, right? If you look, if you parallel this with uh, the three decrees. Um, so as a reform line, it's going to be the time of the end. It also is connected to the 588 years from the anointing of Saul. So that's going to bring you to 509 BC. And Stephen had pointed out yesterday that 509 is 508 years from one, you know, one BC or one AD, right? Just because there's no zero. So when we're going in the past, we, we can actually look at that 509 is connected to 508. And, and so that ties us to uh, the end of Rome. So we have these other things that go on in, in these symbols. But I'm just saying that this makes more sense to me. If we start drawing this on a line, um, I think this line just naturally comes from an understanding of what we've looked at, what we've examined. And I, and I don't see the need to force the seven forms of government into these seven heads. To me, just relating this as a symbol of pagan Rome, this would relate to the seven kings. Now, if it has seven heads and ten horns, we can then equate these ten horns to something, right? And and that's where, when we look at the pioneer view, they're going to just see, just like the heads, they always have to be the same on each beast. They take the horns as being the same on each beast. But we have different things that, that we could look at for what the symbol 10 is. Now, the one thing I have there, um, you know, is the first 10 emperors. And so... If you're going to say that the seven uh, the seven kings are the seven heads or the seven kings, right? It's going to represent those seven crowns. And then you have this period of the Republic, right? In which Rome comes into contact with God's people. It parallels the United States. And, and we know that in Revelation 17, we're going to have... Um, Again, seven heads and also 10 horns. But those 10 horns are going to represent the world. They're going to represent the United Nations. So there's definitely a parallel that we can make with how we understand Revelation 17 and prophecy. But couldn't we not just say, well, when the empire begins, that's the arrival of the second angel's message. They have imperial Rome, I mean. So the emperors arrive. Um, couldn't we place these... 10 uh, horns as these 10 emperors. And so we have, you know, Augustus, Tiberius, Claudius, Caligula, Nero, Galba, Otho, Vitellius, Vespasian, and then finally Titus. So couldn't we place them as these 10 horns? that are going to follow. And in these 10 horns, we have a hint of, of things dealing with the seven kings, right? At the end in Revelation 17, which we still haven't really fully explained. And then when we have these, seven, these first 10 emperors, uh, they're obviously going to be symbolizing 
what happens at the end of the world with the UN. But there's also these kings, right? So those kings, I think, are really, really important because they're going to help us. The seven kings at the beginning and the seven kings given in Revelation 17 are somehow tied together as a symbol. <clears throat> and then we have these, you know, so then we have these first 10 emperors. And so if Augustus is the first emperor, Titus would be the last of those 10. And Otho, Vitellius, and Vespasian are all going to be emperors in the same year. And, it, and it's not really a clear-cut succession of emperors. I mean, they're, they're vying for being uh, the emperor. Um, and just different ones end up uh, leading out, I guess, at the different times. Okay, so Angela has a comment. Yes. So trying to see a connection between Christ's baptism in 27 to the end of the Roman Republic. Baptism signifying choice of death to self and renewal of life in Christ, like throwing off uh, Roman and other governments, which can be like throwing off dominion of worldliness and sin over us. And that's as a question. Um, so definitely there's a connection, I think, between uh, 27 BC and 27 AD in this uh history and how we address this. So I, I do think that's significant. <clears throat> now, we have different events that we, we can mark in Rome, but we also know that there are events occurring in connection with God's people. So if we look at how Rome interacts with God's people at this time, so so they conquer, like in the, the first angel of being empowered in 63 BC. And then we just have the end of the Roman Republic. That's not necessarily, um, you know, we have an emperor there. But when we have those emperors, we're going to have then in that history, the birth of Christ. Um, whether we had marked that as one of the way marks, uh, um, I think what the way mark would be more would be, if we're going to mark it, would be Herod's response to the birth of Christ. And then you also have the Roman government that's going to put Christ to death. But you have other events. You have the siege of Jerusalem, right? So the events with the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans. I mean, so we could just say, well, the formalization is the birth of Christ in 4 BC. Then you're going to have the crucifixion of Christ in uh, 31 AD. And then you're going to have the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. And that's going to be the arrival of the third message. And that's possible, right? So, but how are we going to do this? Is, is that what we're going to do? Or are we is this going to be stretched out further? Because... The point about this great red dragon is it's also going to end up persecuting God's people and they're going to flee into the wilderness for 1260 years. Now, we also on this line, we have the fourth angel arriving, right? So, so we have a lot of events in Rome, but the question is, what events are we going to mark? We've already in this first message marked events in Rome's connection with God's people. Would we continue that in how we address this? I, I don't know if I'm, if people are really following with what I'm doing here, whether you agree or not, because I'm not getting a lot of feedback, but is this making sense or not at, at this juncture? I think so, because we're going to be stuck with Rome in the for form of the papacy till the end of time, till Christ returns. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we should be able to see then that in this line, that it's going to bring us to um, a fourth angel arriving would be a repeat of history. And we, we definitely see papal Rome as a repeat of history of pagan Rome. Right. That's one way we could look at it. It's an extension of it. Um, there's other ways we could create this line, too. As far as the fourth angel arriving, we could say that's, you know, Millerite history. 
sort of tie this history here, you know, hit, bring us to 1798 um, with the fourth angel arriving or something to that effect. Definitely the first part makes sense. How are we going to, how are we going to deal with these? So the second angel arriving, we just say is simply, it's the end of the Roman Republic. Is that the best thing to place as the second angel arriving? I mean, we put the Republic there. Remember, when I put that thing there, it's just, it was already there. So I just, you know, put the Republic there. Um, and then it makes sense if we follow with uh, Imperial Rome. But do we have the third angel arriving as being Papal Rome or do we have the that might make sense. So if we were going to, to do this, um, because we're saying that this is the beast of Revelation 12, but we know the beast of Revelation 12 is going to go all the way to um, it's going to go all the way to um, uh, you know to the 1260 right so maybe there's something we he do here so so this would be that we had in our in our chart below you know just the imperial realm but we'll, we'll do that here We'll put this as Imperial Rome. Okay, so you got Imperial Rome. Now, Imperial Rome technically we say ends in um, four four seventy six. Is that what it is? The fall of the Roman Empire. Well, that's what I read in a couple. Of yeah. Okay. <clears throat> um, yeah. So you know, people have uh, Rome from 27 BC to 476 AD. That's going to be that period of Rome that we would call uh, Imperial Rome. Um, so the way that it's usually seen is the Roman Kingdom, 753 to 509, the Roman Republic, 509 to 27, and um, and then 27 BC, and then the Roman Empire from 27 BC to 395, some people have it as. So there's different... Uh, All right, so 395 to 476. So it just depends on on how people decide where the fall of Rome is, I guess, because um, it sort of devolves a bit, right? Um, and then you got the... So you got the Western Empire falling in 476, but obviously the Eastern Empire continues quite a bit longer until Constantine uh, the 11th. Okay, so any more thoughts on this? So if we take, I'm just going to zoom out a bit. So if we take this here and we could just say, well, Imperial Rome continues till 476. So let's just do this as, remember, we're just doing this as, we're trying to work things out to see if things make sense. Who knows? We may abandon all of this, right? Um, Okay, so you got uh, Imperial Rome ending, you'll say 476. So that's a third angel arriving. And if we did this, 
then we would have to look at um, this as being uh, something to do with papal Rome. Now, whether we bring it to this to 538 or or whatever, that's just that's just we're just trying that out here. So when it comes to in connection with God's people, I think the most active events would be the crucifixion of Christ and the destruction of Jerusalem. Would people agree with that? See, so this would bring you to 31 AD and the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. That can fit. Okay. And then what we see then from the destruction of Jerusalem are events that lead to finally the destruction of Rome itself, right? Pagan Rome. Now, now that, that is a possibility. We could even just not put 476 AD in there. I mean, we have it as Imperial Rome because Imperial, because that's how we've drawn out this line. Um, we could put it as 538. We could just move that over there. And just sort of put all that history together that when the papacy rises, that that marks the end of that period. So, you know, so technically it's 476 that Imperial Rome ends. But as far as this Rome being this power that, pers that persecutes God's people, we know that uh, William Miller marked the 666th year from 158 BTC, uh, he went to 508, right? But we also have the 666 years from 128, 129, however you look at it, to the time of Judean independence to 538. But, but the point is it brings us to, in Revelation 12, to the beginning of the 1260, right? It's going to talk about that period. And so, you know, if I was going to do this, this is just me again, you, know, you guys don't have to agree with me. So if we put the 1260 here, then we can put the fourth angel arriving as 1798. Now, so. Um, and that's going to bring us to where we are in Revelation 13, because Revelation 13 is going to pick up at the end of the 1260. It's going to it's going to be this papal beast that's going to be receiving this deadly wound. And so when we look at Revelation 13, it's going to look quite a bit different than this, because Revelation 13, even though it's the papal beast, it's going to. Its, its line or its way mark is going to be quite a bit different. The way marks, um, and, and you'll see what I mean and, and how I, that I'm understanding this. But this is, this is giving us the history of the great red dragon. And so we would put those 10 emperors, they're going to be from, they're going to cover this period. So I'm going to just change some of this here just hang on okay <clears throat> now we know that Titus of course is not the emperor in 70 AD he's going to be this the emperor though when uh, Mount Vesuvius uh, destroys um, Pompeii and Herculean <clears throat> but we'll just put here, and that's why I'm putting it past 70 AD, the Ten Horns. Now, of course, this is going to disagree with the pioneers. That is, but 
part of the thing that that I'm saying is that the pioneers um, were were trying to understand these things all as the same beasts, basically. This the heads the same, the horns the same. And and they were tying it to the riddle, right? So they're trying to place it in time. So they have this constraint that they were working with. Um, so they would not look at the ten horns as being these ten emperors. I mean, I'm just going to put it, even though I'm just going to put it like that. So we know that it's going to go, obviously, past 70 AD. But Titus is going to be the general in 70 AD and then the emperor after that, after uh, Vespasian. Right? So Vespasian is going to be the emperor. But, but Titus is still there. And um, so I think that's significant. Yeah. So we just say that that 10 horns of the beast of, of Revelation 12, this great red dragon, that primarily is a symbol of Satan, but in a secondary sense represents pagan Rome, is going to be representing this history. So any comments about this? I mean, I know you guys are, you know, this is all new. You're thinking it through. But can you think out loud a bit more? Stephen, do you have any thoughts about this? If you're available to talk. Um, I can sort of see Pompeii, the destruction in the time of Titus. Mm -hmm. Like symbolizing the farm brimstone, the end of the world. Okay, yeah, yeah. I mean, and I've looked at this destruction of uh, Pompeii in seventy nine A.D. when uh, Titus is emperor. I've looked at it for quite a long time. I mean, I I started looking at that when we had the July eighteenth, twenty twenty prediction, and. Um, so try to understand how that would relate to um, to our prediction. But um, so that's when I started looking at it. But then when Odilio started bringing back this idea of these emperors, then I started looking at it again. And, you know, and the problem I had with Odilio's was just starting with Julius Caesar. That's the first thing. But remember, there were so many things about these emperors that uh, become significant. So in this period of time, uh, we're going to have Nero. And Nero is going to be, you know, 20 some years or whatever before the destruction of, of um, I mean, obviously you're going to have these, Nero, when he dies, you're going to have this whole thing of Galba, Otho, and Vitellius. Um, vying to become the emperors and each sort of succeeding very briefly and then Vespasian becoming the emperor and then he's going to continue through the time of the destruction of Jerusalem and then Titus following but Nero has all of these symbols attached to him of July 18th right so um, so he has, and to our history, so obviously the burning of Rome on July 18th becomes significant in, I always forget the year, is it 54 or something like that? I should try to remember it, but. Um, and then uh, we also. 64. 64? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, because he's going to start his reign more around 50 something. Okay. Yeah. So you and then he, he's going to blame Paul as well. Or that, and he he just been released the year before. Right. Okay. So Paul is going to be blamed for well, the Christians, but Paul. Okay. And um, yeah. So you're going to have uh, so in 64 A.D. the burning of Rome, plus also just the fact that Nero's reign goes from October 13th, and I think that must be in 50 something. Um, to June 9th, right? And so we know the June 9th to October 13th 
in our history, so that's a reverse order, in 2018 is that 126 days. Um, so you can see that's going to be typifying this 1260 years to some degree, right? So that symbol is attached to it. Um, so having Nero in there, now I didn't mark him as a way mark because I'm, I'm saying we're looking at the main way marks here are what happens with Jerusalem in their connection with Rome. And so having the crucifixion of Christ in 31 AD makes sense. And 70 AD as the second angel empowered makes sense. Um, but those 10 horns, then this would be showing the work of Rome against God's people. And this comes as part of that judgment against Jerusalem or yeah. So the 10 horns against Jerusalem as judgments against God's people. So these judgments by Rome against Jerusalem, against God's people, are being illustrated by these 10 horns. Now, later on, we're going to have, in Revelation 13, we're going to have 10 horns. Now, those 10 horns are going to have crowns. But those 10 horns are going to represent um, the divisions of Europe that are supporting the papacy, right? But those 10 horns are eventually, they, they turn against the papacy too, right? So we know that, that, uh, that when we get to Revelation 13, you know, we start looking at this, we'll start to see how, how this works, um, how we line these things up. Like once we line them all up together and once we make the whole line of these uh, Revelation 12, 13 and 17, as you'll see the, how they all fit together. Right now, we're, we're trying to isolate these different beasts and draw them on a line. So if anyway, it's just from my perspective, if I'm going to be um, interpreting interpreting this dragon it's going to look a lot different than how the pioneers understood it or how we've understood it in the past. But yet it seems more consistent. And so I'm going to do that. I, I just copied the slide because I'm going to use the same slide. But um, so what I'm going to say, if, if we're going to use this, we say the seven kings of Rome, that's going to go here at the beginning. Uh, I'm going to get rid of these. So these, I still have them. They're going to show up in our other slides. And then I'm going to have the 10 emperors. That's going to be these 10 horns. And then these ones will be applying more to Revelation 13. So... And, you know, I probably should put the years here of these different emperors. I'll do that um, so that we have have their dates because I have them in other, other places. I'll put them in here. So then we'll have this chart of these 10 emperors. Right. So it'll fit under here a little bit differently. Um. Dwight, do you have any thoughts on this? Just kind of thinking it through. Okay. So it doesn't seem completely crazy, right? No, it's not completely crazy. Oh, just a little bit. I didn't say that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's different from what we've had. But it's much more consistent with the idea of the symbols of pagan Rome. And then we can see how these become typical of events later, right? I think we're, what we're looking at more is in, in better line 
with what Father Miller had presented before than what has been being bantered about over the last several months. Yeah. Yeah, because we know that uh, the pioneers did not hold the view uh, that is presently held. So, right. so somebody can say, well, uh, I'm rejecting the pioneer's view here, but the other views are not the pioneer's view either. But if you think about the time the pioneers were living in and how they were looking at this, it's not like they were wrong in the absolute sense. They were trying to make sense out of these seven heads and ten horns. They could see the connection with Daniel chapter 7, but they, they made the assumption that the heads on each of these beasts are the same thing and that the horns are the same thing. And that's, that's kind of a natural assumption to make. Right. We do that all the time. We look for similarities. And, you know, we do that with all the different periods of 70 years. We just think it's the same period of 70 years. But they're not the same periods of 70 years. There's different periods or the two 1260s. We, we just take we just assume that Revelation 12, 7 is speaking of the 1260. That's the same 1260 as in uh, Revelation 7. Uh, yeah, Daniel 12 or 7, as in Daniel 7.25. So Daniel 7.25, it's definitely referring to the 12.60 of the papacy. But Daniel um, 12 or 7 is definitely not referring to that period of time. It's referring to the first 12.60. But we, we make those assumptions. And, and so the idea that he gets this as pagan Rome, but fails to to differentiate these symbols from the beast of Revelation 13 or 17 and has to have a symbol that, that can be the same and that also is the same of the seven kings, the riddle of the seven kings, it makes sense why they did that. It's not going to essentially change their message. Now, there are some people who really want to stick to what Father Miller taught about various things. But the idea that he has of, of taking these heads as symbols and taking these horns as symbols and how he applies them, they definitely can apply uh, in other ways. Agreed. Other visions, right? So it's not like it's completely wrong. It's just not as detailed and complete. <clears throat> At this point, yeah. we have, if we're looking at the the manner in which some of these things were being applied we cannot have everything being so very literal and that's been the, that's been the issue that i've had especially where we're taking the presidents of the united states and using them as a literal fulfillment of so many of these prophecies okay well the, the problem i have with the seven presidents of the united states so i mean there's a number of things but i think one of the one of the aspects that i've had is that we say well the seven heads represent seven progressive kingdoms right but then we do this jump where we now say well the seven heads are actually seven presidents and and that to me just doesn't make any sense. Agreed. Right? That as much as you know, people would try to make them seven popes or something. I just could not do that with the seven heads. Right? To take kingdoms and to make them into seven presidents. Now, I do think though, if we just recognize that there are seven kings, has nothing to do with the seven heads, other than that there's a symbol of that number of the seven heads and these 10 horns in that final kingdom. And then it states that there are seven kings. Then I could accept that those seven kings could be seven presidents of the United States, because now we're addressing at the end, seven kings, just like at with the beginning, we have seven kings. So with ancient Rome, it begins with seven kings, right? And when we get to modern Rome, it's going to end with seven kings. 
So to me, that would make more sense. But you wouldn't have the heads be the, the kings. And because in, in Colin's place, he's going to have basically an application of a prophecy, which doesn't, to me, doesn't track that way. It just doesn't, it doesn't make sense to apply it that way. Now, we do know that we have all of these other seven kings that we've studied, the seven kings of Persia, the last seven kings of Judah, the first seven kings of Judah, the last seven kings of Israel, right? We've looked at these different kings. We've looked at the presidents of the United States in connection with the kings of Persia. So we have a basis to do that, but to force that into the seven heads and to make that all of these beasts have to have the same seven heads. But now you're going to make those heads the presidents of the United States in an application. To me, it doesn't follow. Right. So when Colin first presented these things, I could see where things would lead. But I knew that there's something there that we have to study. And I still don't know if that we've, I don't definitely, I definitely don't think that we understand everything we need to understand about this. But when we get, when we finish this off, and then we go back to Daniel's last vision, I think that we should continue going through the rest of Daniel chapter 11. To, to fully understand what's coming upon this earth, where we are right now in Bible prophecy. Right. I mean, because we could just finish off, you know, once we get through this, we could just say, well, here's what Colin wanted us to look at. Uh, but I don't think that that's where we can stop. I think we have to go through the rest of Daniel chapter 11 and see how that tracks with what we found. I think that would be a wise move. Yeah. Because I know Daniel chapter 11, even though we've gone through it many different ways fairly thoroughly, now that we've gone through our experience uh, over the last few years, and especially in how we studied in um, the book of Judges, I think we all have a much better understanding of what's happening in Daniel chapter 11 uh, than we've had in the past. And I think some of those things that just didn't make sense or didn't really seem to fit will start coming together. You know, that's, that's my belief is that we're, that's where God's leading us in, into understanding that. Um, so, so anyway, that's Revelation chapter 12. That's as far as I could go. I don't know what else I can do with it. Uh, you know, there's a number of things, though, that I find interesting is that um, when we, and, and the one thing we haven't done, but we're going to do this more when we get to Revelation 17 and we get to the riddle, Um I think there are things that we can see in the history of the seven kings of Rome that we can apply. So what I mean by that, when it says five are fallen, one is and one is yet to come. When we look at the one is, um, that's going to be the sixth, right? That's Servius Tullius, right? And and even though we're not there, we can we can bring ourselves back to there and say, can those seven kings of Rome symbolize the seven kings that are being represented in Revelation 17? Right? I'm not saying that because John's definitely not there at that time and the prophecy isn't applying there. But because there is a parallel. And what does Servius do? What is his most notable contribution? It's going to be the Servian Wall, right? And what is the Servian Wall? 
I'm not familiar with this. Okay, this is the wall that they built around Rome. This is the wall that encloses these seven hills of Rome. Okay. All right. Now, um, and if you want to see this Serbian wall, um, let me see if I can find it here. Um, Are you trying to draw a, draw a parallel between the Serbian wall and Trump's wall, which he never completed? I, I wasn't necessarily trying to do that. I mean, because what does a wall represent? Um, closure and safety. Okay. The um, law. Yeah, the law, of course. The law of God. The, but right. It closed the seven hills to make sure their foes couldn't mount those hills. Hills and attack Rome, right? Yeah. Yeah, before they had, um, like, you know, a fence. But, you know, they're going to build this stone wall. And... Uh, so if you want to see this wall, um, let me see here. Now, there's a number of things that, um, and, okay, I'm looking at, just trying to find this here. Um, yeah. Okay, I just so they built this Serbian wall. So it's the first stone wall, and and you can actually see this. Well, here I'll show you this here. So this is in a, a video that I was watching. Um, so this is part of the Serbian wall that still exists. Now, this part of the Serbian wall is not the part that was built by Servius, you know, because they've taken the wall down and built it up at different times. So so this one is going to be um, uh, probably in the fourth century BC. So it's going to be you know a few hundred years after Servius. Um, but also you can go to a McDonald's. Uh, where you there's actually a breach in the Serbian wall, and that's the entry to McDonald's. So if you want to go see it, you can go to McDonald's um, in Rome and see the Serbian wall. I thought that was kind of interesting. It's pretty bizarre. Okay. Um, but but all I'm saying is that, that we haven't looked at these kings really in detail in trying to compare them, but we have done this with other kings, right? So we did this with the Persian kings. We make these parallels. And, and so maybe there's something there about Servius being the one that is. And, and yeah, and if that parallels Trump, then, you know, that would be interesting. But I'm, I'm not so sure that I'm just going to make that direct comparison like that. <clears throat> okay, so... So anyway, that's where we're going to end today. I thank everybody for being here. And you can see we got a lot of work cut out for us in going through these, these histories. So um, we will, uh, tomorrow, I'm just going to get the dates up for the different emperors. We're going to just touch on those emperors a little bit more. Um, and then we'll probably come back to the kings of Rome as we get further in, like into Revelation 17. Uh, but I'd like to start on drawing Revelation 13 on a line tomorrow. So <clears throat> let's close in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for the time that we've had this morning. And um, we are thankful for the things that we are understanding. We know that we may not understand everything correctly. It's most likely 
there's things that need to be corrected, but we just are thankful that you have helped us to examine these things, analyze them, and to see what we have seen. And we just pray that you can guide us as we continue forward in these studies. We pray that we can bless each of those who is searching out these things, and that your angels can watch over and take care of each one. Thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.